Okay, all right. So let's see. Got somebody here already. Where is that? Why am I not seeing that? Am I seeing it? Am I seeing it? Gotta talk back. All right, Germany. Let's see. What the? This is something's not happening about this. <laughs> Cheapest piece of gear that I loved. Uh, let's see if I let me do this. I'm not gonna play any music. Maybe if I turn this up, maybe this way, we'll get a little more of my talk back to the uh, to you guys. Try that. I hope that's hot now. Let's see about that. Ah, oh, sorry. All right. Cheapest piece of gear that you love, man. Um. Um. I don't know, man. Recording gear or drums, and I'll be right back. I figured I'll change some heads with you guys. Uh, seems like it's, yeah. All right. going on no no I'm an ambassador guy I use uh, uh, I, I like single ply heads uh, have for a long time I mean I use emperors occasionally in a certain setting but uh, yeah So you guys have to bear with me. <clears throat> uh, I'm figuring out the best way to do this. Uh, I don't realize these things are going to post, but uh, uh, yeah. So obviously, I'm going to zip these things off here this way. But a couple things I do. Differently, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, methods out there that people people uh, kind of adhere to. For me, since the time I was a kid, one thing I don't do, and, and if I'm live, I, I might uh, do it because you know we're ripping through heads, you know, one night uh, to the next. But uh, if I'm here in the studio. I don't like to uh, crank the heads way up and crack them in and all that stuff. And the reason for me that I don't is I feel like there's a certain amount of elasticity, elasticity that the head loses uh, resonance and um, attack character that never comes back. And if you think about it, what it seems to be to me, and this is just the way it hit me from the time I was a kid, uh, is that there's a certain pliability or elasticity to that head and when it pushes in 
the farther it's able to push in, uh, it's going to snap more. It's going to bloom more as a note. So we're talking about subtle things. But what I do is I bring things up to pitch that I want for tuning. And then, of course, they're going to slip. There's going to be some cracking as I'm playing them in. But when they seat that way to me, two things happen. I use single ply ambassadors, whether they're coated or clear. And when I have time to do it that way, uh, the heads don't pit as much. Uh, they just generally have more top end and they sound better to me. Now, uh, everybody has their own experiences with it, but that's how I do it uh, when I can. I bring them up to pitch and I keep just gradually bringing them up as they slip and you crank the shit out of them and all that stuff breaks and then you back it down you've just taken some of that elasticity out that's what it seems like to me so anyway that's how I do it this is my uh, maple gum pearl kit that I had out the last couple of tours with Toto so that's what I'm getting I'm reheading a few things here for some work I'm going to be getting into tomorrow so anyway that's the trip <clears throat> I already have my key. This is the 12. I also found if anybody's using uh, uh, these Pearl Optimounts, uh, they can be a bit uh, temperamental to deal with, especially depending on the angles that you hang your toms at. Uh, and so you just kind of have to, t and, and you, t you know, you have to tune around that and feel for tension. Uh, if it's starting to bind, or if the drum is starting to choke out a little bit, or resonate unevenly. Like right now, I mean, my whole approach to tuning is is I feel with the key more so than I worry about tapping around the drum and all that stuff. Of course, that's a valid way of doing things, but. Um, but also, uh, it's very much a feel thing for me. And, and so sometimes you can't, like the tension, obviously, as I'm pushing in here around these grommets, it's loosening up the tension right. So you know there's going to be added tension and sometimes a loss of resonance from that bind, you know. But I just work up from there. And you hear it start to cry, and I'm barely putting tension on the head. You're already hearing a little bit of popping and seating going on. Uh, Anyway, that's the way I do it anyway. I'm going to go into much more detail about that uh, coming up here. I'm going to organize an event, probably a clinic-style thing, that we can do online out in the big room. A lot of times for me when I'm... You can just kind of feel. You know? As you're going up with, with the fingers and find any kind of problem area. See, this one feels like it's already tighter. And my experience is, is also that rather than, you know, when you go around and you're tuning for pitch and you're doing this thing that I see a lot of guys do, and that's fine, and you're trying to figure out why these are interacting and it seems like it's a much larger uh, drop in tension here to get the, an even note here it's because in my experience when you're trying to detune this or you've got something higher or lower in one spot it has more to do with the opposite tension rod than it does the two on either side of it so like you're trying to average these things out but check it across from there so that's it that's one thing throwing on yeah so so these are clear ambassadors here uh, am I missing anybody and like I say th these things that I do live are, are not I you know if you want to go back and check them out after the fact they may not make a lot of sense as a matter of flow or whatever because we're just hanging out I, I'll I will edit some things and post a little more concise uh, look into some of these things as I get deeper into this but uh, these are supposed to be just kind of casual hangs where we're going back and forth, riffing. Where did you find all those CS15s? 
who the hell knows what a CS15, but good for you. I grew up with those microphones here, Electro Voice, uh, if you guys check out uh, the room there, it's, it's what I use on my toms, and I've always preferred condensers to dynamic mics on toms, they just have a better frequency response overall, and uh, these mics are from the 70s, and I, I just, I kept looking uh, over a long period of time. I think I have 10 of them by now, and some of them I paid as little as 50 bucks for. But uh, And also, I'm a pretty eh, fledgling tech, so I can go into some of these older pieces and do some repair. So I, I recapped most of the ones that I have. But right there, there's still a little bit of something going on with it, but that's without really doing anything to the drum. blow your heads off if I hit it hard in here so I'm not going to do that but there's one down and like I say I'll keep I'll keep uh, pulling them up as they set they seat in a little bit uh, where are we at here uh, all right I've been, uh, with this kit lately, I've been playing, uh, for a long time I played, uh, basically my setup was based around what was pretty standard in the 70s when I, you know, was a kid getting my first set of drums, 12, 13, 16, you know, and then you add a 10 or you add an 18 or whatever but it's basically that very standard thing and then within those sizes I, I used 10 12 13 14 by 14 for a long time because uh, like all of us you know we're influenced by certain people and I'm a big Jeff Porcaro fan and a fan of his sound and that's what he used a lot which was smaller drums tuned down a little lower which lets for a bigger uh, warmer note you know and which typically is is conducive for recording so uh, but lately, um, with this kit, because I have a few different things available, I try to keep a few things on the floor ready to go so I don't have to change heads every time I can just change drums. I've been playing uh, 12, 13, 14 uh, racked toms. And essentially, they're just tuned almost to the same pitches that the smaller drums would be, but it just changes the voice of the drums a bit. But the intervals typically tune out pretty close to the same. Uh, but I'm I'm a big I'm a big fan of uh, Gary Husband and the sound he gets. So I've kind of been playing around with that on this kit. It's a lot of fun, really really explosive sounding, and especially in that room out there of mine that can really it really excites the room when they're cranked up like that. Uh, so yeah. watching paint dry at some point I suppose but uh, same process around all, all the drums you know uh, like I say I'm gonna go into much more detail at some point with with some uh, you know structured kind of videos that are put together for to be informative but uh, yeah you can even you know when things start to seat you can see that already for whatever reason it's uh, the head is seated closer to the the mounting system here, and maybe that's just, you know, I'm not sure why. Uh, maybe it's just the added weight, I don't know, but uh, yeah. So also what I do when I'm pulling things up from nothing, you know, when they're, that just seemed to have tension on it already before I added any beyond finger tight, you know. Uh, so you have to kind of realize, I don't need to go here and crank this up. There's already tension right there. You can feel it. It's like I even... Even at, like, essentially no tension on the head, there was already tension there. So you, you, have to, you have to consider what the head is doing visually and by feel, not just, you can't just trust the tension of a tension rod always, you know. 
certain, you know, if you have some older drums, and I have some of this that goes on, you know, that some of the threads can kind of get dirty and tight, so you have to kind of look at it a little more from a feel perspective and a matter of averaging things. Also, as a little side note, I, I used to, uh, when I was younger, I would change bottom heads every time I changed the top heads on my, every time. So when I was doing sessions all the time, every time I would change my toms, I'd change top and bottom of everything. And it makes a difference. It's a pain in the ass, but it makes a difference. Again, you're dealing with slipping and things breaking in, but it sounds better. It just does. And sometimes, you know, you can go, okay, where is that rattling? You know, like, oh, well, it's right there. I can see it, you know. I mean, you can hear it and feel it, but there again, by the tension rod, the feeling of resistance in the tension rod, not really telling the whole truth. And depending on the kind of heads you use, the manufacturing and whatever, there's going to be some inconsistencies in the collar. So you just can't be a bonehead and go, well, shit, I did everything even. It doesn't sound good. It's like, well, it's not an exact science, you know. And even then, I won't know until I get them out on the stand. And then they're going to change again, right? Uh, just, just the nature of binding and even in a best case scenario. What else we got here? Oh, shoot, I left the camera in the other room. Yeah. <laughs> Chris McHugh. Look out for Chris McHugh. It's trouble. <laughs> Actually, Chris, I'll text you right now. Oh. <laughs> Chris is an awesome drummer. I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware of him. If you're not, you need to be ton of uh, played on a ton of records played uh, you know and one of my favorite drummers and uh, one of my very best friends so Chris McHugh go find him if you haven't already This is too boring for you guys. All right. Now this drum is set more where I left it, where I had it pitched up. So typically, like even where my 13 might be, this is a 14. And what you get when you pitch them up like that, <laughs> you get uh, you get more of that. You know. So you got the center frequency, the real nice note. All that stuff that I like to kind of think of as a timpani-esque, more symphonic, orchestral kind of activity in the sound of the drum, from jazz tuning to whatever, when I'm playing these bigger drums tuned up, it's two things. If it's like fusion kind of stuff, obviously the tension on the head's going to give you better uh, articulation than double strokes, but it also gives you those added harmonics to the drum, which gets more... Um, interesting if you will but again there's a reason that that tuning works better for you know different ensembles it's because uh, if you are playing instrumental music and it's a smaller ensemble then there's more room in the uh, in the in the sonic you know space whether it be live or recorded for those harmonics to to ring out and actually be audible but i also always tune my drums a little dirtier or nastier than you might think because when they're real flat and even, they tend to just, you know, disappear against other instruments. You know, sometimes they're sharing the, uh, you're sharing the same uh, tonality, even pitch uh, frequency range area. And a little bit of a wave in the drum uh, cross maybe a consistent note in a guitar or a bass or whatever. It, it brings your drum out of the track or out in the room, out in the PA or whatever. So... You know, if you tune your drums super, super clean uh, and super flat, they, they tend to uh, 
get eaten by everything else. So, that's another tip. Thanks, everybody, That's for the kind words there. Hey, Monica. Oh, how are you doing over there? Uh, Monica uh, is a sweet friend from my years of touring over in Switzerland. As a matter of fact, if you look on my YouTube channel, on my little profile, little round picture there, uh, that's a picture Monica gave me. So... Check that out. Another thing, okay, while we're at it, you just kind of forget things. I would go through when I was a kid, before I was, you know, fortunate enough to be in, uh, an endorsee of, of uh, Remo, and, you know, that's what I always played. I would go to the drum shop and I would go through stacks, stacks and stacks of heads tapping them to find ones that had a note in them already. You know, it's just kind of an indication that there's good tension, you know, to the uh, collar. Everything's nice and solid. And I would look for the heads that, that you know, just kind of made the most resonant note just straight off the, out of the box. And I would take those. And Actually, through the years, that, that cons has, consistency has gotten much better. Uh, just through manufacturing, you know, uh, adjustments, I suppose. Uh, and I don't do that anymore. I just, I get what I get sent to me, and I, I can't remember the last time I got a head that I had to put back. So, another little point there. Uh, yeah... Yeah, you know, the, somebody's asking about the Jeff Vaccaro setup, and, and believe me, I mean, it's obviously highly uh, influenced by that setup, but, you know, that's that's not that... I, I kind of set up in, in what is, again, fairly generic. I mean, if you take that down and remove pieces, voices from the kit, less toms or whatever... It's basically you got a four-piece kit. Let's go back to jazz and whatever bebop as far as you want. Well, where are you gonna? If you want to add a drum, where are you gonna put it? Well, you might put it back here. You might put it right there. You know. And so it's sort of, I don't know. It's about the sizes for one thing, and it's less about. It's less about emulating maybe the physical layout of it, or the look of it, than it is having those voices available, those pitch. You know. I've always, almost always had a 10 set up, and anytime I'm recording, I'll pull whatever I'm not using to, uh, to remove sympathetic ringing in the room and, and just to clean that up. Uh, you know, and some guys, some idiot engineers who go, oh, you're going to set up five toms. It's because of so much ringing. I'm going, you know, I know a lot of really great sounding records where the drummer had at least five toms, maybe more, that sound better than anything I ever heard you do, and you're complaining. So, you know, just, it's all about what's appropriate for the music, and I like to have, you know, it's like, look, let's get sounds while I'm, while I'm getting here, and let's get a sound on everything, and then we'll take down whatever I'm not going to use. But don't, don't tell me before I get to the session, or before we get started, what we're not going to use. It's like, how the fuck do you know? So, anyway... That's why I learned how to be an engineer. You wouldn't believe some of the asinine things I've run into in Nashville with engineers. Or maybe you would. And I don't like lightly call myself an engineer. I have spent my 10,000 hours in here. I grew up around it. <clears throat> Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dial everything into a point, and then I'll tune them at the drums. Uh, I have a session tomorrow. Maybe it's it's difficult. I would love to be able to have you guys in on a on a recording session, but you get into 
copyright issues and someone's unreleased music they don't want to have out there until it's finished. It would be great even if I, I wanted to give you guys a drums only feed of what I'm doing. It's kind of tough to do that because then you know the person is you know paying for for my time and my contribution and they don't you know somebody could grab a, a stereo mix off of what I'm playing and then be using what I did for them. So I'm I'm working on ways to figure out how we can do some of that. I tell you what, here's a good way. If somebody out there has a, a track, a cool track that you want drums on, uh, maybe we can do it that way. Send me something if you're okay with people hearing it before it's uh, released, and we could do that. A funny story about 13-inch toms that I may get wrong a little bit here because it was secondhand to me, but uh, I find a lot of time in the city is they ring toms unless it's very prominent it ends up getting covered up. In the That's exactly right. It's a great observation. You find that a lot of times any sympathetic ringing with the toms. It, it, it gets eaten in the mix. It gets kind of covered up by other things. And that's true. And there's a fine line there, uh, you know, where it becomes sort of a cloud underneath there that you can't really hear, but it's there. But at the same time, it's, I don't know anybody that doesn't cut all the in between of their toms out. You can do it with Pro Tools. A monkey can do it now. You know what I mean? So, uh, uh, but, you know, that's what these are for, you know? Cut and fader, you know what I mean? That's like, uh, so what's the big deal? But yeah. Well, to get somebody says, "Damn, I just got here." The good news is, I'm, I'm I'm really am committed to doing doing this a lot. But at the same time, if there's anything you missed, you can go back and watch it. I suppose later. Uh, why am I doing this this way? Oh yeah. 13 inch toms. It's funny, I had guy, you know, there's been people over time that would go, how, how do you get a sound out of a 13 inch tom? I, I have such a hard time tuning it, I'm going, I don't know, I never, I never noticed that one time ever, so I, it, it could be, um, sometimes what that is, is, be, you know, when you have drums mounted a certain way, uh, the way they're mounted on a stand can make it uh, choke out a bit or it can make it resonate unevenly make the shell vibrate unevenly could, could so maybe when you were dealing with a 13 try taking that 13 from whatever position you have it mounted it in and mount it where you have something that sounds good and you may find that the drum is fine it's it's how it's being mounted so you have to play around with that so but back to the story of the 13 inch top and my my dialogue or, you know, my, my experience with uh, Chris Brady of Brady Drums, who's brilliant, amazing human being, uh, and would not make a 13-inch tom, right? I think uh, if any of you guys are familiar with him, you would know that. And I'm very, very, very humbled that he made me the only, I have the only 13-inch tom, as far as I'm aware of, that he ever made. Uh, but the reason that he says he didn't build it was he asked uh, William Ludwig at one point, you know, like why, why? How did you come up with the sizes that you arrived at for, for you know? And basically, the way I understood the story to go was that well, when you when you had a 12 and you're 16 and you and you you took the wood out of or whatever other configuration was involved, 14 whatever, there was a blank sheet basically left or whatever the uh, whatever the amount of uh, material left over would make a 13 inch drum so that's why there's a 13 inch drum apparently and therefore it's sort of a born out of a, you know a cast off reject but uh, who doesn't love a 13 inch tom anyway but yeah and I got uh, believe me I uh you know, I have a couple of kits that don't have, two of my Brady kits don't have a 13. And that 14 tunes up to where I would typically pitch the 13. And it's great. So I got fairly used to that too, but uh, 
which is probably why you notice like this kit I have a 8 by 10 8 by 12 9 by 13 10 by 14 16 by 16 16 by 18 and basically that's so that I can do a lot of different things I can do what I'm talking about you know if I'm going if I want to mess around toward uh, Gary sound Gary husband sound then I've got 12 13 14 16 18 um, if I want to go toward the John Bonham thing, I've got 14, 16, 18. Uh, if I'm, you know, going toward the Jeff thing, I got 10, 12, 13, 16, 18. Uh, you can go a lot of different ways, but uh, and that gives me the choice. So uh, basically, these days, what ends up in or out of the equation is the 10 or the 14, seemingly. Now, see, this is all jacked up already. <clears throat> Yeah, 13 and 16 is great. That's right. Um, I see somebody's comment. He says, I love my 13, but when I put it up next to my 12, it kind of eats the tone. That's sympathetic stuff and the distance and pitch between the two drums. And a lot of times it's in the room. It's literally uh, the acoustics of the room that you're in that's you'll have dead spots in rooms where certain things uh, regenerate like the reflection of your drum in the room sends sound back at it that keeps the drum resonating and you can be in certain spaces where there's absolutely a hole in one frequency range so you can hit that 13 at a certain tuning point and it'll barely make a sound at all and then the drum just tuned above it will, will be in a spot where it's really regenerating so that can be a difficulty, uh, but it's typically not the drum, it's the room. Or something about the symp sympathetic vibrations in the room. See, I can already tell this is wanting to be a pain in the ass. See, I feel like I've got tension here and all I've done is set the head on here. So, is it really sitting that unevenly? Chris calling. <laughs> I can already tell this is problematic here. I can tell I'm putting tension on it. It's like, oh boy, this is going to be a fight here. It feels like there's tension where there's not. So to get tension over here, right, I had all this uneven wrinkle and everything and there was already tension here seemingly I pulled it out on the on the tension rod and the lugs across from it is what it ended up, ended up being so it's the way they interact so even though that I had really only f put a finger tension on this tension rod it, it just the way it's see, sitting in it was already had tension on it so So, oh, I gotta go get the 16. I'll be right back.
Somebody asked which 40 Tours intro did you prefer? Uh, well, I preferred Devil's Tower just because I preferred playing, you know, that. I was playing, you know, that, that track was more, um, uh, you know, I just liked that tune better. Uh, probably because it was Jeff, but, uh, but it, uh, That track was, to me, is unmistakably a kind of a Toto sounding thing, and and alone kind of lent itself more toward, you know, other influences. So I just uh, I had a personal preference toward the Devil's Tower track. Oh, somebody says I own one of Jeff's kits. I do not. No. No. Uh. Your signal flow changing depending on the project you're working on. Um, it's funny. So we're talking about uh, recording drums at this point. Uh, and yes, this is the kit that I used in 2019. Um, I've kind of gotten to a point where, and I was, uh, I have a way of, that I feel captures the drums, uh, for me in the most finished way towards a mix. So when you're picking things out, you pick your microphone first, and you want to pick a microphone specific to whichever drum you're recording, overheads or whatever, that gets you the closest to the EQ curve that you're looking for. So if it's an overhead, you want something fairly flat or maybe with a little bit of a boosted top top end frequency. But my, um, yeah, basically it doesn't change much. I found that uh, I have certain things available. I have two sets of overheads that are combined uh, because I don't like to have 8,000 tracks of stuff in Pro Tools just because I can't make a decision or commit. So. I have two sets of overheads that combine uh, into a stereo track that's a Glenn Johns method, and which is one mic overhead and one kind of over here measured back to the snare drum. And then I have a conventional sort of left-right, not XY, uh, pair that are KM86s. So I have Coles, 4038s, and KM86s. Uh, and then... Uh, that kind of catches things. I have a, a room mics, your standard stuff, a mono room mic. But I find more than anything else, when you're going for a sound, a vibe, a particular thing, it's it's about the instrument. Uh, it's not about rolling off all the top end and all that stuff. It's it's like I, I feel pretty good about the way I'm recording drums these days. And if I'm going for a vibe, you got to make the drum make that sound. It's wholly different than, than trying to go, oh, I want this to sound beatly or whatever. And and you're trying to get it through microphones and compression. It's like, well, no, the drum has to sound like that. It has to be played with that velocity, which wasn't from back here, you know. Uh, a lot of things involved. So mostly I keep the same signal path. I'm going to change it here soon because boredom, you know. But, but at this point, what I've landed on, I'm... It's kind of uh, something that works really well. And with the two sets of overheads I do have combined, what I will do is sometimes I will omit the uh, one set or the other of the overheads. Uh, the coals are a very thick, fat sound, and I like overheads to be a full range picture of the kit. They're not cymbal mics. So um, depending on what I'm wanting to do, uh, it's real easy at arm's length for me to go, okay, I'm going to turn off the KM86s, and, but I'm committing to that. I, I just don't like the idea that, oh, to, to, you know, I felt like this was what the song was. Uh, if anything, uh, I've learned the lesson the hard way, maybe not, you know, that your first impression is usually the best one, you know. It's going to be it's reactive, and, and, and so I try to keep that approach even if it's somehow tying my own hands so that I can't go back 
and go there. I just I just remove the option. I don't let myself because I know you know we're all prone to overthink. Maybe not not all of us, but uh, anyway. <laughs> so where am I at here? See this one's like I've got this this just feels bad right here. It might be the washer. You know, but it feels like it has three turns of tension on it right here. I have to say also, just off topic, um, my tech and all the guys with Toto, Larry Crow, Robbie Cope, all the folks that came in contact with my drums over the course of, you know, a couple hundred shows at least uh, they took such great care of my stuff I mean not a not even a scratch you know that's awesome and that's guys that you know they, they give a shit and they also play and they wouldn't treat their own gear like that so anyway all right guys experience but sometimes the, the larger the diameter the trickier things can be a little bit but not always just because the the amount of you know distance from point to point for tension gets a little greater but uh, it's pretty good I've got some other stuff to do, but um, I'll try to get back on tomorrow. Um, so thanks, everybody, for showing up, and uh, we'll catch you soon. All right. Later.